Our first interview in the series is with Colonel Rick White. And I picked Colonel White because I wanted to talk to him about leadership. Colonel White has a vast range of experiences, all the way from being a very young man thrown right into combat, all the way up to extended periods of time of peace, where he was an administrator and leader of several thousand men at any given time. He has a vast knowledge of raw leadership, leadership under stress, leadership when life depends on it, and leadership during times of peace, where I was fascinated because you can't really know about yourself as a leader until you're really tested. And I know that Colonel White has been tested, and I know because he was tested at such a young age that he was a born leader. I also respect him because I know that he took a huge responsibility as being that leader and he developed himself over a period of time to get better and better and better for the good of his men. So I think he has a unique perspective on leadership and life. And that's why I'm doing this first interview with him and I hope you enjoy it. Colonel White, thank you for taking the time to speak to us today, thank and you, uh, it, I'm very humbled by your offer to do this today. I'm very appreciative, so again, thank you. I guess before we get into some of the questions on leadership that I'd really like to dive in with you today, I wanted to give you a chance to give a little bit of your background, a little bit of your mm -hmm. story. I've heard your story uh, before from you and, and how uh, you went from Norcross <laughs> young boy Norcross all the way to today, and it's a really fascinating story. So um, I know it might be a, a lot of effort for you because you've probably told this story a lot, but um, I think if we could start with that, uh, that'll probably get us off and running. Well, thank you, Dan. And likewise, you said you're uh, glad to be here. I'm also honored that you would uh, think about me to, uh, to share some of my experiences and things that I've learned along the way. So background. Uh, so. Uh, grew up uh, in Norcross, Georgia. Um, never really left the state of Georgia. I mean, I was just a, I wouldn't say a poor family, but we, we had our own struggles, kind of a little small farm community. Uh, grew up, played uh, all the sports at Norcross High School. In those days, Norcross was a very small town, unlike it is now. In fact, the high school, when I graduated in 1965, our claim to fame, we, we were the first class that had three digits we graduated 100. <laughs> so before that, it always very small classes. And so we had uh, four sports, uh, baseball, basketball, football, and track. So if you were able to stand up, you could make the team. <laughs> so uh, played, played all those sports, primarily football and track. It was, uh, it was my main sports. Um, grew up in an era, so I was born in 1947. So I grew up in an era that all the men in our community, relatives and so forth, had lived through the Depression. Our moms and dad had lived through the Depression. They had lived through World War II. And uh, we came along where we were kind of cognizant of the Korean War because mm -hmm. we were little guys at that time, five mm -hmm. and six. So all our men, basically men that we looked up to, mm -hmm. were all veterans or guys that had lived some pretty tough life counting the Depression mm -hmm. and World War II. And so those were the kind of role models I grew up around, our, our, from our parents to our relatives to our Sunday school teachers to our pastors to our coaches to our teachers, all had that same ilk. They were all about America, patriotism, and not mm -hmm. necessarily did they go around talking about it a lot. It was just there. Mm -hmm. you, knew what right, you knew what right looked like growing up. Mm -hmm. You know what right and wrong was about. Yep. And you knew that if you kind of stepped out of line, it wasn't necessarily your mom and dad corrected you. It could be anybody that knew about you or knew you or observed you. So <laughs> there were pretty good left and right limits of growing up. And I don't mean that was in a bad thing. I think it was wonderful. It really built character. Uh, so growing up in that environment, um, in, in, again, in the South, and I didn't grow up anywhere else, so I'm in the South. Mm -hmm. So my impression was your life's training model, if you will, <clears throat> you finished school, you worked, or you went to college, or you went in the military, 
and you did all of those and not necessarily in that order. So I knew in kind of the life's uh, uh, training schedule, mm -hmm. I was gonna be eventually in the military at some point. I knew I was, wanted to finish, a get a degree. I knew I would eventually, of course, uh, work and have a career. So it was just kind of taken for granted. Mm -hmm. One of the most life-changing things that happened to me uh, was when I was 10 years old. And when that happened and what this was about, I was, we went to Norcross First Baptist Church and I was 10 years old. And in that Sunday school class, there were maybe, I don't know, five or six of us little 10 year old boys. Our Sunday school teacher <clears throat> was a gentleman by the name of, of Thomas Johnson. And Thomas Johnson owned and ran the local uh, hardware store, uh, general store, if you will. I mean, you could buy everything from cow feed to screwdrivers. I mean, everything in the store. Right. Thomas Johnson was a World War II Marine. Anything Mr. Thomas Johnson said, we, <laughs> we're going to listen. And he was <laughs> very kind, very good man. I don't mean, he, he, but he, we respected sure. his experience mm -hmm. in the Marine Corps in World War II. I don't, Dan, I don't remember any Sunday school lessons. I'm ashamed to tell you. I don't remember any of my Sunday school teachers really too much, but I remember this one lesson in this one school teacher, one uh, Sunday school teacher mm -hmm. when I was 10 years old, mm -hmm. Thomas Johnson. He's the Marine, right? He's the Marine. Marine yeah. And there's, again, five or six of us little 10 year old boys squirming around and trying to be good, but he's teaching her lesson. Mm -hmm. At the end of the lesson on this one Sunday, he said, boys, when you go home tonight, when you do your prayers, I want you to start adding two things to your prayers. We kind of set up straight. <laughs> this is, okay, yeah. this Marine's going to tell us something big, you know. And he said, I want you to start asking God for two things. Start, and, and don't just do it one time. Do it from now on. We're listening hard now. Mm -hmm. He said, number one, I want you to ask God that he will direct you to your, the right woman you are to marry. We're 10 years old. You know, <laughs> girls, are you kidding? We, we kind of giggle and squirm around a little bit. We calm down. But okay, that was number one. Pray for the lady, the woman that God would have you marry. After we kind of settled down after that one, he said, number two, pray that God will direct you to your life's work. And he said, if God will direct you to your life's work, it'll be a calling mm -hmm. and you'll never work a day in your life. That was a huge concept for a 10 year old to absorb. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he kind of went into a more detail about both of those. He said, if you find that right woman to marry, and if you find that right calling, you'll have a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. Hey, but you were 10 years old, but because he years, said it, yeah, I mean, you knew it was important. I'm right? 10 years old. <laughs> I'm right. 10 years, I mean, that's huge concepts if you right. think about oh, it yeah. for mm -hmm. a 10 year old. But okay, I'm obedient. So that beginning that night, and from then on, I prayed, I added those two requests to my prayers every night. <laughs> request number two happened before request number one. Mm -hmm. So I finished high school, I played football, I uh, had a real tough football coach, great guy, great role model, I never heard him say a curse word. Uh, we just had, we went, the football team went to church together, we rotated, whatever. So there were five or six churches in Norcross, and every Sunday we'd go to a different church in our uh, coat and tie to church. Before the day of the game, we would go to school in our coat and tie. Before the game, because we, he didn't want to, he wanted to corral us, we would have manner classes uh, hmm. taught by the home ec teachers. You know, manners. I mean, just this guy was, he taught you how to articulate, talk, because uh, he was preparing us for life. It wasn't yeah. just about football. Right. He was preparing young men for life. Two good role models, Coach Al Clanton yeah. and, and Thomas Johnson. So anyway, so I finished high school. I get a track scholarship to Georgia State University. It's, commutal, it's a community, uh, commuting college. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, every day I'm driving back and forth to Atlanta. And, um, and it's now fall of, uh, summer and fall of 65. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In 1965, in August 1965, the, uh, America, uh, the uh, first cavalry division was formed out of Fort Benning, Georgia, and they deployed to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, hard to imagine now, but there were three television stations, and the news lasted 15 minutes each. Mm -hmm. So you, you did not have this 
<coughs> seven news, continual uh, news going on. So it was 15 minutes a day and three television stations. So, and that came on, I think, like six o'clock at night. And I, not that I always caught the news, but in those days, because the 1st Cavalry Division had left out of Fort Benning, Georgia, <coughs> to Vietnam, Georgia kind of claimed the 1st Cavalry Division as the Georgia Division. Mm -hmm. Well, if you'll recall, there's a movie called We Were Soldiers, mm -hmm. and there's a book called We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Mm -hmm. And Hal Moore at the time was a lieutenant colonel. And the Battle of uh, uh, LZ X-Ray happened, and it was the biggest battle to that point. You can imagine, now that this quote, Georgia Division, mm -hmm. this 15 minutes of news at night, and that was what the focus was hmm. in the fall of 1965. And I had started having this tremendous, I knew I was going to go in the military at point, one point, mm -hmm. but I had this tremendous calling or almost a guilt feeling. I went to the Army recruiter in March of 1966, and I walked in, and... Um, and there were, it was crickets. I mean, nobody's lining up to go in the military. I mean, <laughs> right. It's very quiet. And I walked into the recruiting station downtown Atlanta, and the sergeant said, may I help you? And I said, yes. He said, uh, I said, I'd like to, I want to, I want to become a paratrooper. I want to, so it wasn't like World War II where they were flooding in to sign no, no, up? No, no, it was no. Like, no. I mean, of course, yeah. the draft was going on. Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, you either okay. volunteered or got drafted or you were physically unable, which, you know, it was kind of, you're either going to go in voluntarily, yeah. be drafted, or you're not physically able, uh, whatever. Got it, yeah. And I said, I want to join the United States Army. I want to be, a, I want to be an infantry paratrooper, which in my mind, that was kind of the toughest thing you could do. Mm -hmm. And okay. A few days later, I'm on a bus to Fort Benning, Georgia to go to basic training. And I had no intention. I, I just was going to be a soldier, serve my time, go to Vietnam. You know, I just felt that calling. That's what I was supposed to have done. Because, as you recall in my early remarks, my role models had been World War II veterans. Hmm. All those men that I grew up around and was impressed by and looked upon as leaders, hmm. they had served their country in combat in World War II. And I am a was a product of that. Were you sure it was your calling? I mean, did you feel like not, it not was... Not at that or, point, no. Okay. no. It, it, was, it was something I knew I was supposed to do, needed to do. Just for that time. And for that moment. Yeah. So I'm on the bus. I go to Fort Benning. And I will tell you, and, I'm, and I'll tell you straight up, the first night I laid on a bunk in an Army barracks in Fort Benning, Georgia, I knew that's where I was supposed to be. I knew I was supposed to be in the Army. And I'm a private. I mean, all I know, I'm going to get trained for about eight weeks, and, or about 16 weeks, and off to Vietnam as an infantryman. The first night? I mean, I, yeah, we, I, knew, I, I knew what was coming up. Did that feel like, did that feel very comforting or is it motivating? I mean, just, was it? I'm going to do it. I mean, I'd played, yeah. I'd worked hard all my life. I'd played football. I was not afraid of challenges. Uh, I was in very good physical condition. You know, I've been running track and cross country, played football. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just I, I, physically I felt good and <clears throat> I felt that was what I needed to be doing. Well, I'm in uh, basic training and <clears throat> I guess I'm doing okay. And so... The drill sergeant comes by after we've been about four weeks and he says, uh, White, yes, drill sergeant, you to report to the company commander tomorrow morning, 0800. Well, there was God and then was the company commander and then us. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you just didn't go. I'm a private. You didn't that, to go see the company commander was you either were in trouble. <laughs> right. It was not necessarily a good story. Yeah. Yes, drill sergeant. Um, got any questions? Yes, Joe Sergeant, what, is, what, what does he want? I right, he'll tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so all night long, I shine my boots and get my little uniform ready, and the next morning I go report to the company commander. <clears throat> and he's sitting at his desk, and he's looking down right now. I'm, Sir, Private White reports. <clears throat> he kind of looks up and gives me a halfway, you know, gives me a salute, and he's back to writing. He says, stand at ease. So I stand at ease. And I'm quiet. I mean, it's silence. He says, uh, first things out of his mouth, says, looks up, he says, we're sending you to OCS. And he goes back writing. And I, yes, sir. Quiet. Got any questions? Yes, sir. What's your question? What's OCS? <laughs> yeah. 
he holds back this smile, just thinking, <laughs> this dumb kid. Uh, well, go talk to your drill sergeant. He'll tell you what it's about. Yes, sir. I salute and move out. I mean, that's the long, that's the whole conversation. Right. <clears throat> I go back. See the drill sergeant. He said, what do you want? Of course, he already knew. Well, what did the company commander want? Uh, drill sergeant, he said, they're sending me to OCS. All right, good. But I'm supposed to ask you what that is. <laughs> I wanted to know what it is. He said, <laughs> again, he's probably thinking, this dumb kid. That's officer candidate school. Okay. Oh, okay. So I go through infantry basic training, infantry advanced training. Mm -hmm. I end up at Fort Benning, uh, the OCS at Fort Benning. I train as a, to be an officer for six months, and I'm off to Vietnam. <clears throat> and I was commissioned at age 19. So uh, we started probably 300 young men in, o in OCS. We graduated 169, and we all <clears throat> off to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Our class got there pretty much in the Tet, of six, uh, Tet Offensive of 1968. Mm -hmm. In about 10 so things were really <clears throat> hitting the fans. Yeah. <clears throat> so we were, and we didn't know that was what's going to happen. We just knew we got to Vietnam and, and the stuff really broke out. Of those 169 young men, about 10% were killed right away. And I don't know what the percentage of were wounded. And at that 169, and now I'll fast forward a little bit, <clears throat> a few of us made a career. <clears throat> some of the other guys had some prior service, so they stayed in the Army to get there 20 years or whatever. And of the 169, there were three of us that stayed in and made colonel. Uh, I, I was one, and there was two other guys. Um, I was the youngest in the class. This has to do with leadership, by the way. Mm -hmm. I was the youngest in the class. The other groups, I mean, there were about five or six of us that were not college graduates. I was not a college graduate. The, and the others were either college graduates or they had been sergeants in the Army. And now they're in OCS. And they're older, more experienced. Mm -hmm. So I'm the, young, I am the youngest guy in the class. Mm -hmm. I am not a college graduate. I am not a former sergeant, and I'm off to Vietnam. What were you thinking at that Years time? Were later, you thinking that, was that, did that bother you? Or well, it... it scares me more now than it did then. Okay. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, because I guess ignorance is bliss sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All I knew, I was trained well, and some of the best advice I got was listen to your sergeants, lieutenant, hmm. when you get to Vietnam. And I got to Vietnam, <clears throat> uh, and we go through about a week of uh, acclimatizing, you know, because it's hot, it's humid, mm -hmm. and so forth. You get your uniform issued, your weapon issued, uh, and I'm assigned to um, the 4th Infantry Division. And how old were you at this time? I'm now in 20. I'm an old man of 20 now. 20. So, and I'm, and I'm in the infantry, and I'm going, we know what's going to happen. I mean, going, you're going to be fighting the enemy directly. <clears throat> I get there, I, I leave uh, at, day after Christmas 1967 to go to Vietnam, and now it's the end of December, I spend a few days getting my uniform and briefings and so forth, and they say, okay, White, Lieutenant White, you're assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 35th Infantry Regiment, 4th Infantry Division. Got it. So now we're getting ready to go out to the, the field because <clears throat> you're kind of back in a big base camp, relatively secure. Nothing was really secure, but it was pretty secure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so a helicopter lands, and then myself and one other lieutenant who I never saw again, I don't ever know what happened to him, a, a Huey helicopter landed, and uh, it was full of sea rations, water, and ammunition, and two lieutenants. They said, get on that helicopter. And said, yes, sir, we take off. As we're flying, <clears throat> they, I'm flying over bomb craters. I mean, it, you can tell you're in a war zone. I mm. mean, it's, we're flying low and fast to stay out of the small arms range. We're not shot at, but you know, that's just the flying. As we're approaching the landing zone, now we don't wear any rank in combat, so I'm just, you know, fatigues. And it's, it's loud. The doors are open on the Huey. In fact, there are no, they take the doors off. So you're just sitting, the wind's blowing around. And the crew chief leans over and grabs my collar and he pulls it up so I can hear. He said, listen, where we're going, this fire base is under fire. 
the fire base is under fire, it's under attack. When we land, I'm going to throw all these sea rations, this ammunition, this water off, and you, if you don't jump off first. You got that? Now, he's probably a specialist. I'm a lieutenant. It doesn't matter. We're just guys going to war, okay? Mm -hmm. And his point is, a helicopter is a target. Mm. We can't be on the ground but seconds. So you, if you don't get out quickly, I'll be throwing your young self out right. real fast. For your own good. You got that? Mm -hmm. Got it. We come down, a big boil of dust comes up. As we're approaching that landing zone, there's a burning helicopter mm. that we pass over. The fire base is under attack. Mm -hmm. And so we come in, and uh, sure enough, they come in there real quickly. See rations, ammunition, water starts coming off. Two lieutenants come flying out of there, mm -hmm. and that aircraft takes off. I mean, we're literally on the ground seconds, or they're on the ground seconds. We're out there in the in the dust and the dirt, and we kind of get up, and somebody on the LZ said, so what's your name? I tell him, what's your rank? I tell him, he said, go report over there to that bunker. So we, he and the other lieutenant and I race over and go into this bunker. And uh, we're receiving rounds, you know, there, there's a battle going on. So the enemy's mortaring and so forth. And uh, I found out later. So there's they, no transition period. You just no, get no, out. We're, and we're, we're, just, we're in con I mean, it's like yeah. day six of Vietnam and you're in combat. The other five days was just getting your stuff oriented <laughs> and so forth. Um, so we go into the bunker. So you go from this bright sunshine into this bunker and it's dark. And uh, so we walk in there and, and we're standing there and a, a figure appears before us. This guy has a cigar in his mouth and uh, comes up to us in a real strong Southern accent. What's your name? To both of us. And the other Lieutenant says his name and looks at me. He said, what's your name? I tell him, he said, where are you from? Maybe he heard a little Southern accent at the time. Where are you from? I tell him, you know, Georgia. Where in Georgia? Norcross, Georgia. Norcross, Georgia. You know where Clarkson, Georgia is? Yes, sir. He's the battalion commander, by the way. I said, yes, sir. We used to play them in football. <laughs> and, I, and I think he even said, oh, you mean the Angora Goats? The Ang you know, Ang Clarkson Angora Goats. The Norcross Blue Devils. Big rivals at the time. Of course, he's a lot older than me. He said, what'd you do at Norcross High School? Would you play any sports? Yes, sir. What'd you play? Football and ran track. Well, you're the Norcross Flash. So he, he would name everybody, give them a nickname. Mm -hmm. So I was the Norcross Flash. Mm -hmm. We're talking, this is a conversation, we're talking 30 seconds or less than a minute. There's a war going on. He says... Uh, you're wondering if he's noticing? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he, he, he's, he's just got fresh blood. Yeah. Because I mean, okay. these guys are getting killed. I mean, he's yeah. just, these are replace, we're replacements. We're just cannon fodder. He said, you're, the other guy was a But he took the time to ask yeah, you some questions. He knew a little and, bit about us. I mean, okay. he was doing his... And then he gave you a name, He was right? practicing yeah. leadership. Yeah. I mean, he was getting to know his men as best he could. Right. He assigned the other guy to A Company. He assigned me to C Company. He said, you're white, you're in C Company. Your company commander is Homer Kraut. That was his name, First Lieutenant Homer Kraut. You got that? Yes, sir. Get out of here. We go out. I don't know where C Company is. I go outside, back in the sunshine wars going on. I said, where's C Company? They pointed me across the area and I dash over there. I find the company commander, Lieutenant, first Lieutenant Homer Kraut. I'm a second Lieutenant. He'd been there 18, he'd already been there a year and he'd been extended or he extended mm -hmm. for another six months. Mm -hmm. So, um, I run over to what they tell me where C Company is and I find the company commander again, first Lieutenant Homer Kraut. Now this, I don't ever think I ever saw him smile. This was a hardcore fighter. I mean, this guy, I mean, I have total respect for him. He'd already been in Vietnam uh, a year. Mm -hmm. He had commanded a, a rifle platoon, mm -hmm. a reconnaissance platoon. Mm -hmm. Now he's commanding a company. Mm -hmm. He had just returned back. His home was in Virginia. <clears throat> Very smart guy. I mean, this guy was a brilliant. He, he could go through books several in a day. It's just a, just a tremendous brain, tremendously brave. He had already been awarded two silver stars for, for mm -hmm. valor. Mm -hmm. And you were going to be under his command. And I'm going to be one of his three platoon leaders. Okay. So he's a company commander. I'm a platoon did leader. Did you start to, I mean, did that make you feel 
and he well, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're better. all serious. I mean, we're we're in we're in combat. I mean, we're yeah. in war. There, there ain't a lot of joking going on right now, you know. So active active combat. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. We're we're this is war is happening. <laughs> uh, we're be, again that but the uh, battalion commander by the name was um, uh, Bill Livesey as a lieutenant colonel. He later retired as a four-star general. Okay, so he already fought in the Korean War, and now he's a lieutenant colonel. Now we're now I'm talking to the company commander. And so the Livesey conversation, a minute, he gets signs me to C Company. Now I'm talking to Homer Kraut, another minute, mm -hmm. across 100 yards away. <clears throat> he says, you got third platoon, helicopters inbound, we're getting ready to go on a combat air assault. <laughs> yes, sir. Third platoon's right over there. Go, go find your men. I run over there. And so I'm looking for the platoon sergeant. So I'm the platoon mm -hmm. leader now. Mm -hmm. So again, that Homer Kraut's conversation is 30 seconds a minute. We're getting ready to go. We're getting ready to do a combat air assault in helicopters. We're out, going out to find the enemy. Mm -hmm. Okay. I go find the platoon sergeant. He had been there. I found out the lieutenant before me had been killed a few days before. And so I'm talking to the platoon sergeant who had been in country about five days or about a little longer than I had. I mean, he'd been in. He said, Lieutenant, we got the guys lined up, the helicopters inbound, go get over there and that bunch there, it, we, we call it sticks, because you line up and then you, four or five guys on each side of the helicopter and that's a stick. Mm -hmm. And the four guys get on, now you got eight on a helicopter. He said, go get in that stick over there. I found, I heard his name, so I knew the battalion commander was Livesey, I knew the company commander was Kraut, I knew the, I heard the platoon sergeant's name, and I know, here's what I know, and now the helicopters are coming in. Again, that platoon sergeant conversation is about 30 seconds. Helicopters come in, we get on the helicopters, and we're off. And we're going on a combat air assault. Mm -hmm. I'm flying, and I start praying. And, and not praying for me, I'm praying for, because through this whole time of in the Army, of responsibility, know your men, know your mission, know what you're going. I don't know any of that, Dan. Here's what I know. My name, I know I'm in Vietnam. I know I'm in the 4th Infantry Division. I know I'm in the 35th Infantry Regiment. I know I'm in C Company. Hmm. I know I'm the 3rd Platoon Leader. I don't know any of my men. I don't know their names. I don't know how many men I have. And I don't know where we're going. I just know we're going out to find and fight the enemy. And we're going into what I don't know if it's hot, a hot LZ would be you're being fired or a cold LZ, you're not being fired at. That's all I knew. So while I'm, we're flying, I'm praying, dear Lord, don't let these guys get killed because mm. I don't even know who they are. Don't let them get wounded. I don't even know who they are. I felt mm. tremendous responsibility, mm. a weight of a 20 year old. He's 20 years old, yeah. <laughs> Later I found out I got about 35 men but at that time, I had no, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know their names. Age 20. I knew my 35 name. men in combat. I knew, right. I knew three names, four names counting mine. <laughs> and I'm going into the teeth of the dragon. It, it was not fear. I'm not saying I'm a big, tough hero. I'm not, it was not fear. It was the tremendous weight mm -hmm. of responsibility. If these guys, I don't know, if they get killed, I don't know who their mother is. I don't, I don't know anything. But, but your to, instincts were to think about them I'm thinking about, first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that's under the heading of selflessness, yeah. but it's not yeah. because I'm a great guy. It's right. the inculcation of responsibility. Mm -hmm. We go in, we hit the LZ, the, the landing zone. <clears throat> it's cold. The gunships around had done a great job, artillery prepared. So first that God answered the first prayer, it was a cold LZ. Hmm. We land. And we patrol for the next 47 days without stopping. So we, every other- Cold meaning like com, no combat? There's no, there's or... no con, they, they decided not to shoot at us. Okay. So it was a cold LZ. Got it. As opposed to a hot LZ. Got it. We land, and now for the next few days, I start obviously start who, who my guys are, how many guys I got, and so forth. And then I'm learning, uh, you know, Homer Kraut's teaching me, 
you're in combat in the jungle in Vietnam, you're 20 years old, you got 35 men, you're, you're responsible, you know, for all this. And in the, in the military, there's a saying, the commander is, is responsible for every, everything the unit does or fails to do. That's one reason I don't have any patience for, and this applies to industry, government, anything, it's the other guy's fault. No, it's not. If you're in charge, you're, you're responsible. I don't care if you've been in charge like I was 30 minutes. I was responsible and I was in charge and I was responsible. I don't have any patience for people that blame the other person ahead of me, below me. Well, I've accepted this outfit, uh, this company, this, this job, and it's all messed up because he or she did, eh, that's not right. Mm -hmm. You're, you're in, you're in charge from right then. Be a man, be a woman, stand up and take responsibility. Mm -hmm. We patrolled for uh, 47 days uh, with that. We didn't wash, we didn't, I mean, it's, it's, you're in jungle. Our clothing consisted of, we, we did not wear underwear because that held moisture to your skin and you'll get skin disease. We had a shirt, a pair of pants, a belt, two pairs of socks, a pair of boots, Helmet, weapon, web gear, about 100 pounds of ammunition, food, and um, sea rations and water. And that was my wardrobe. Mm -hmm. uh, bathing was a, a luxury. Uh, we did try to brush our teeth, but you were constantly on the move. Every other night, you were on an all-night ambush. The other night, so out of three platoons, you would have always, um, out of, excuse me, out of four platoons, you'd always have two on ambush, staying up all night, the other two back protecting the command center. So in a period of 48 hours, a lieutenant like myself, you were averaging about six hours sleep in a 48 hour period, and you're eating about one meal a day. And the reason you're eating one meal a day, because you gotta carry everything. So you train yourself to discipline yourself. It's more important to have water and ammunition than food. You, you could get by on one meal a day. So if you look at pictures of guys that were in Vietnam in the infantry out in the field, they're all skinny. Uh, that's just, the Army did the best they could. But alive. Right? Alive. <laughs> I mean, we just didn't, we didn't yeah. get resupply. We get resupply every seven days. Seven days worth of sea rations is a load mm -hmm. if it's three meals. So you learn to not to eat three meals because you can't carry it all. So after 47 days, we finally, uh, we had contact off and on, we get into a fire base that's relatively secure, and I get to wash for the first time in a, in a actually a, a white water stream, and there's probably a hundred guys, there's security out there, and the hundred guys buck naked, wash it, and it felt so good mm. to just to clean a up. A moment of peace. And, and, your, of and your clothes would actually rot before mm. they would, would change it. So we were there for about two days, then we go up into the mountains, and we walk into a three machine gun ambush, and um, that was the first big contact we had had. So a lot of, a lot of guys were killed and wounded. I was, uh, I won't go into all that, but. Uh, um, how did you, let me ask you this. So how did you, uh, when you're, you know, you're leading these men, you go in and it's just mm -hmm. chaos and resources are sort of, you don't know what you have. You, you might have this, you might not have that. Bathing becomes sort of an afterthought. I mean, how do you, I mean, and these guys, I'm thinking they have to be scared, right? Like. I'm going to die. <laughs> How do I get out of this? Blah, blah. And they look to you as the leader and for, to hang on to something, right? Like, how do you know, I, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I got to take care of these men. Um, I have limited resources. I don't, you know, this thing is hot. And how, how do you write yourself so that you can <clears> give <throat> those men something to cling to? Like, well, I'll quote George Patton, General George Patton. A leader has to be a good actor. <laughs> When everything is falling apart, mm. those men, those people underneath, they're going to look at you. Mm. How is he going to react? Mm -hmm. You got to be cool and calm under pressure. You got to be like a duck. A duck is smooth on the water and his feet are paddling like everything underneath. Your mind, your, what you're thinking, what you got to be doing has got to be like that duck's feet underwater. But your outward appearance has got to be cool. Let me give you an example. We'd be in contact. Contact meaning we're fighting. <clears throat> you got to make radio calls to your commander, tell them what's going on. 
and we would concentrate on being, I'll just use the call signs we use, Charlie, Charlie six is Charlie three six, we're into contact, we have, you know, very, just like we're talking about Braves baseball, calm, cool. If your voice inflection went up, those things, you know, people responded to that, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, I mean, I've heard guys, uh, sir, I've taken a round of, I've been, I've been hitting the right arm and you just, it's like he's talking about, I cut the grass last night, you know, an actor, a leader has got to be an actor. That doesn't mean being false. That just, you're doing it for others. Mm -hmm. They're looking at you. Mm -hmm. How are you going to react? How are you going to, because it's, it's, it's so contagious. The leader's response is contagious. If you're, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Your, your thing's going to fall apart. If you're cool, calm, directive, sec, uh, in, uh, secure in your own being, they're going to pick up on that. It's contagious. Um, in that battle, this is the 26th of February, 1968, was a, a huge battle that we were in. We lost, uh, we walked into a three machine gun ambush in, in a, just a matter of seconds. We had a lot of Americans dead and wounded. And uh, my company commander, I had to go in and pull those guys out, myself and I. And the machine gun fire was so close to the ground, I mean, uh, you, you couldn't get low enough to the ground crawling up. And we'd go up and find a a guy that was dying or dead and we'll pull him on our back. And uh, so now, you know, your, your weight and his weight is about the same as your weight and you can't even get up on your knees to crawl. So you're clawing your way through the jungle floor to get down to a place and, and get them evacuated. During that battle, the reconnaissance platoon leader was with us and he was wounded in the chest and so there's only one reconnaissance platoon in a battalion. So I was made reconnaissance platoon leader. So the rest of my Vietnam tour, that first tour, I was the reconnaissance platoon leader. Uh, that had some effect on me later in life for PTS. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> when you're in a regular rifle company, in other words, you're surrounded by about 100 guys. Each platoon's about 30 something times four. You're give or take about 100, okay? A reconnaissance platoon is also about 30 guys, but you operate by yourself. Mm. So they would send us, so now I'm a reconnaissance platoon leader. And so they would put us, uh, we'd go on seven day missions. And so again, all the food you can eat are for seven days, a lot of ammunition, grenades, claymore mines, mm. all this stuff, machine gun ammunition, water, you're weighted down. I mean, you're, you can't stand up straight. I mean, you're you got a hundred pounds in your back. And we'd go on these long-range, deep reconnaissance missions. You're trying to find the enemy. Mm -hmm. The deal is you're not trying to fight the enemy. You're trying to find the enemy so higher forces. And not be detected, too. Not right? be detected. Yeah. So the reason I say that I have PTS with this is because we'd go on these missions. And for days on end, the loudest you can talk to the guy is the enemy. Mm -hmm. So, and you're, you're whispering, hand and arm signals. You're sleep deprived. You're food deprived. You're mentally exhausted, tremendous responsibility leading these men. You're a role model. You've got to be tough, lead that, lead uh, the example. Days on end, and you come back in for 24 hours, get more equipment and so forth, and go back out. That affected me later uh, in life uh, for loud noises. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm doing this because this is therapy. Yeah. I'm giving you therapy right now for mm -hmm. myself. And so that affected me in this, we, this regard. If you're in reconnaissance and there's a loud noise, if you didn't create the loud noise, that's bad. Yeah. A loud noise means somebody shooting. Very startling, trying to kill I would you. think, yeah. So yeah. loud noise, sudden. Hmm. If I create the loud noise, well, that's different because I know I'm going to create it. So the way that's affected me in, in life is uh, if, if, a, if there's a loud noise, even if a loud voice is, if I don't know about it, I, that's a reaction. Uh, if I if it's really bad, I'll actually get um, uh, nauseous mm. because uh, what's <laughs> happening what's happening is uh, our body is designed for fight or flight. Yep. There ain't no flight in me. It's all going to be fight. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm startled, 
my body's going to get a flood Those of chemical adrenaline. Yeah. I'm going to get a whole bunch of adrenaline because my body is saying it's fight or flight, in my case, fight, and this lasts for about that long. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, that was a loud noise. I don't have to do something. Mm. My body has now received a tremendous surge of adrenaline. And that's where the nausea comes in. Mm -hmm. I feel like, because my body didn't do anything without adrenaline. I didn't go do something. You know, I just, so I've learned to deal with that. And so what I'm doing, telling you this right now, this is my medical people I've talked to, this is better to talk about it. And then the better, more I talk about it, the less of those uh, situations happen to me. And I've never done anything stupid or violent. It's just, it's just a, it's, okay. so that's just, I never got wounded in two years in Vietnam in the mm -hmm. in jungle, never got wounded. So I tell people, uh, um, not every wound is visible, you know, so. Uh, when you say that, when you say that you talk about, it, I mean, that, that's, that just reminds me um, <clears throat> of, you know, I think a lot of leaders, they isolate a lot and they might think things to themselves because they try to be that actor, right, of that can't be weak, can't, can't even let my, you know, my wife see me be weak because then right, she'll right. think, well, yeah, and you can't really have nobody to talk to. You can't mm -hmm. talk to the people in your command, can't talk mm -hmm. to, you know, because you don't want to look weak. You have to be a good actor. So how do you, I mean, how do you, you know, what, did, what would you say, to, or what did, how did you process those types of feelings uh, of maybe being alone, being isolated, or, or doubting yourself? I mean, I'm sure on some of those reconnaissance missions, you had a lot of quiet time to pray, ask God, but a lot of doubt would creep in, and maybe, you and know, your, things. And you, your, your senses, <clears throat> you are, your senses are so acute in a reconnaissance mission. Or, mm -hmm. you, I mean, it's in Vietnam two years. Um, you're, you're seeing, you're smelling, you're tasting. I mean, you, I could feel the enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I knew if they were there. I never got surprised, by the way. Mm -hmm. I never, we were never in that reconnaissance platoon. Uh, we found the enemy. They never found us, okay? There's a price you pay for that, though. I mean, you're constantly on mm -hmm. all the time, 24-7. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a battle of attrition in some respects, right? I mean, yeah, back to your question. <clears throat> you don't really have a lot of time to contemplate your feelings. You're just your own. Mm. Later, when you're out of that situation, that's when a lot of these, that's where a lot of uh, combat veterans have issues later. Um, it could be years later. It could be 20 years later. And it kind of comes back. And we, we find that uh, uh, this happened in, I guess, all wars, but uh, we find that, okay, so I, I come out of Vietnam, I have a full career in the Army, I'm go, 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 have a wife, children, go, 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 retire from the Army, another job, go, go, go. You finally retire, and that's when it starts, y your mind has time to relax, and these kind of things come back, and that's when mm. you really need somebody mm. to, to talk to. Uh, and it's... And the reason I tell those stories like that, it's okay, because a lot of guys look at me and said, hey, if, if White can say it's okay to talk about it, I guess it's okay. You know, it's not a weakness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a dealing with what you have to deal with. So uh, I tell anybody, I said, uh, in, any bad press that the VA ever got, I never saw it. They've always been very good to me, very helpful. I have a, a buddy that was a Marine sniper in Vietnam, and uh, he has similar issues that I did. And when he found out that I, it was okay for me to go to the VA and talk about these things, he, and then he went. Mm -hmm. And so it's not being, quote, a man to keep it all inside. You need to, you need to have a battle buddy. Yeah, I've so, always felt like, and, I, and I've told other leaders and maybe business I've talked to, that those allowing yourself, <clears throat> yourself those moments of weakness, you, you let yourself be weak so that you can stay strong. Yeah. You think, well, how does that make sense? It, it does make sense, right? Because mm -hmm. you're, you, you take a little bit. It's, so, it's humility. Yeah, you have to rest. You can't work out constantly. You have to rebuild and yeah. recharge, yeah. right? It, it's, a, it's a sign of humility as far as I'm concerned. Um, when I back to the thing about being an, a leader, being an actor, I mean when you're in the heat of the battle. In the, in the battle, I don't mean just war. I mean the heat of the business meeting, the heat of the, whatever, uh, a sermon. <laughs> I mean, that's the heat of the battle. That's when you got to be... Because you can't let that, uh, that contagious, uh, potentially contagious, mm -hmm. uh, go out to other people. Mm -hmm. 
But you do have to, the actor can't be the actor all the time. The actor's got to go back and relax. Mm -hmm. So I was in the Army 31 years, and so uh, I was blessed that I was, uh, was able to command 13 different units uh, in the Army, and that, I'm not, that's not a boastful thing on my part. I'm just saying um, uh, that I was selected to command a lot, a lot of soldiers, a lot of uh, people for 31 years. And so uh, you learn about leadership, either formally or just by experience. Mm. People have asked me, or you know, there's always been the debate, seems like, are leaders born or made? You know what the answer is? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I've seen people that <clears throat> really didn't have leadership, born with leadership qualities. Maybe they're very uh, quiet or just kind of stand back. And they were placed in situations they had to lead. Mm -hmm. I've seen other people that, uh, you know, we're gung-ho and forward out and the captain of the football team and all these kind of, and get placed in situations and they didn't do so well. So it's, it's not, leadership is not something you ever don't continually learn about. Mm -hmm. And you never, there's never, you know, I compare leadership to medicine. You always, you, you practice medicine, you know, so a doctor never knows everything there is to know because he's, he's in the practice of medicine. I look at that, leadership's always a practice. You're always learning. Yeah. There, there's certain... Uh, I think that's a really important part of just from what I've observed of leadership is that continual mm -hmm. wanting to learn. You know, and the scriptures teach us that seek wisdom above all else, right? So when I'm someone like me talking to someone like you, it's, hey, I'm going to face certain situations in leadership. And it is highly mm -hmm. unlikely that nobody else has ever felt like me. It's highly unlikely that nobody else has ever overcome what I'm feeling. If I can find that person <laughs> to teach me, I can get mm -hmm. through those situations mm -hmm. better, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how you make yourself, I think, a strong leader. Because you can be born to lead. You can be born, I think, to be the captain of your baseball team or this or that. But like, you go into combat mm -hmm. and you learn things about yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, I would mm -hmm. think in tough times, and then you fine tune those things. You have the self awareness, mm -hmm. but you continue to learn. I think any leader that thinks they had it figured out, mm -hmm. they just fizzle out eventually. And when they get tested, they kind of just fall. Yeah. You know, so I think it's a really important point that you're making about the continuous humility of knowing I could learn how to be a better leader today than I was yesterday. And you right. learn from everybody. You. Uh, <clears throat> One of the best examples I remember in, in Vietnam is just another example. I had a buddy of mine, he was also a platoon leader, and he kind of taught me something one time. He said uh, he would find the most quiet, timid soldier in his unit and have a conversation with him. And he would find something that that soldier knew that he didn't know and ask that soldier to teach him that. Man, you have, you have got a friend for life. Mm -hmm. You know, the captain, the lieutenant, the sergeant, whatever is asking me, private white, about whatever. And it doesn't have to be a, about your military things. It mm -hmm. could be anything. Mm -hmm. Underst hey, Dan, I understand you really know a lot about baseball. Can you tell me what does it mean? What's an infant? You know, you're teaching me. And it's not, you're not manipulating people. That's not the point. You really are trying to all, that's leadership. That's just the leadership. And this individual you were talking to, he said, doggone, he's pretty good, good Joe to talk to. He doesn't act like he knows everything because you don't, you know. Or maybe um, I don't need to know how to do it, but what I need to know is what has God given you as a gift mm -hmm. and how can I use it mm -hmm. so that we can succeed, right? Because everybody has one. Yeah. Everybody has a gift. I want to know what yours is. Yeah, find, find interest in everybody. Maybe it is selfish. Maybe I do want to win, <laughs> but I still yeah. want to know. And find <laughs> interest in everybody. Mm -hmm. Find some in things interesting. Because you play a part you in this. Everybody teach. does. You can always learn. Tell you something mm -hmm. else. You learn more from bad leaders than you do good leaders. Mm. My, experience, my experience. My yeah. experience. Uh, I've seen the people that have uh, maybe just not even good people, but they happen to be a leader and they're not a good leader or they do bad things. I learned as much or more from those folks as I did the people that I tried to emulate. Make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, it, so take everything's everything in life is a lesson. You mm -hmm. know, keep keep trying to learn. You brought up something uh, just a few minutes ago about wanting to be a good leader. That, I've got several little notes that I uh, developed over all these years, and that's called desire. 
desire to be a good leader. Also, it goes back to responsibility too. Yeah. If you say, yeah. if I'm responsible for these mm -hmm. uh, people, I, I've always taken the, uh, I've told my, my sons that, hey, you know, I don't, don't drink, don't smoke, get stuff in time. And I say, well, like, I, I want to be better. Yeah, but at the same time, I feel like I've got, I got a lot of families that are counting on their income based mm -hmm. on what I do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so I have to kind of be like that. You, you bring up uh, smoking and drinking. I, I, uh, I never smoked, I never drank, and uh, so forth. And uh, people say, why not? Or, you know, weren't you ever tempted? And I said, well, I learned early on, like, if I, were, if I were a smoker, back in the early days, they wouldn't probably do this in the Army, but in the early days, they would have smoke breaks. And so if you messed up, uh, we're in training, let's say basic training or OCS or whatever, you're in training. If you messed up or they wanted to punish you, they take away the smoke break. Okay, doesn't affect me, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That was one thing they couldn't yeah. take away from me. Yeah. Now, if they took away food and water, you know, that's different. Right. But, I mean, okay. As far as the drinking went, I said, I'm a leader. I cannot afford to ever not be in total charge. I don't care if you're after duty hours and so forth in Private Smith's in an auto wreck mm -hmm. and you got to go show up at the hospital. You don't want to show up intoxicated or, you know. And you don't also, by the way, you don't know when you're going to get called out to go do something. Yeah. I, I was always on duty. You got to be ready all the time. 24-7. Yeah. In my mind, I'm on duty. So it didn't. And with you, it's life or death. Yeah, I mean, for I, I me, it's not life it, or death. But if you, <laughs> I didn't see any advantages to it. Yeah. It's not that I'm a goody-goody. That's not the point. Yeah. I'm very jealous of my health. God only gave me one body. I want to take good care of it. You know, so I didn't want to do things that would harm that. I've had, uh, people have asked me, uh, in fact, this happened yesterday at a luncheon with three other gentlemen. And we were talking about leadership, uh, ironically. And they said, what do you think, Rick, what do you think is the most important quality of leadership of all the things? Humility. Hmm. Humility does not mean you're a doormat. That's, that's, not, that's not what that is. Humility is recognizing that you're not the... If you think you're the smartest guy in the room, that proves you're the dumbest guy in the room because you're not. You know, don't be impressed with yourself. Have humility. Um, well, arrogance is a weakness. Arrogance is a liability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and it goes back again to learning something from everybody. You can learn something. Um, but I think you wake up, you have to wake up every day for like, I mean, Michael Jordan, I mean, being in combat. So you wake up every day thinking today could be the day I die. Mm -hmm. That it could be the day I'm going to lose. Today mm -hmm. could be the day I lose all my money, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You don't think like that. That one day mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that you're not humble, mm -hmm. it's over. It could be. You had one of your questions, and we've kind of got ahead of your no, question. Okay. But one of your questions, uh, I remember, you read said, "What do you?" It was something about firing somebody. I think you were. Yeah, I remember one time you had told me something that really took me aback because I see a lot of leaders out there, and there's a there's a lot of. Uh, I think common, common knowledge, not common knowledge, the term would be, oh, I don't know, uh, a certain paradigm of thinking of how to treat people that are dead weight or how to you know, treat people that aren't performing. And they say, oh, secret to business is you fire the people that aren't performing. You got to have the gusto. You got to have the, uh, you know, strength to fire people that aren't performing. Right. And you can even see it in our uh, you know, say the prior president, I mean, he had a show all about firing people, right? And I mean, and, and he would never hesitate to fire somebody. But you said, I never fired anybody. And I thought, man, I never how, could, how could a strong leader never fire anybody? That, that just went against everything I ever thought. And I thought your answer was awesome. So I wanted to revisit that. And I would like to know too, if you have one, one of the questions that was really important to me on my mind was, what do you, obviously when you're, uh, you know, you'd mentioned I was 20 years old. I had 35 people and stuff and, and maybe touch on at some point the, what do you look for in those people that are on your team? Right. And it's like, and maybe you don't have a choice to fire that person, but it's like that if that guy doesn't get to where he needs to be, it's going to affect everybody. And, and then there's, there's people there that you might see that are, they have what it takes and they might need to be, you know, elevated someday to my position or something. Like, what do, what do you look for in the people that are on your team as being like mm -hmm. the really good qualities of, of people that you want to serve underneath you? Oh. I would put that under the word sincerity. Huh. What, what, do, what do you mean by sincerity, Rick? 
What do I mean by this? Whatever line of work you're in, combat, selling insurance, selling shoes, preaching, teaching, whatever, is sincerity when you deal with other people. Mm -hmm. Look them in the eye. Dan, I'm really dependent on you to fill in the blank, whatever that is. Because I, I really, here's what I believe about human nature. I do not believe, I think people have enough self-pride, whether they even recognize it or think about it or talk about it, they have enough self-pride to want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. I don't think people get up stretching in the morning, well, I'm going to go to work and really mess that place up. Can't wait to get in there and mess it up. I don't, people don't think like that. Yeah. What we have to do as leaders is pull out those great qualities that everybody has. Mm -hmm. And when I say I never fired anybody, it was up to me as a leader to find out if, if, if he was messing up or she's messing up, that's, a lot of that's my fault. I have maybe haven't placed that person in the right position. Now, let me qualify this. A, uh, an individual that's got a company, you maybe only have a payroll that can only afford 10 people. So I had a luxury in the Army of maybe I didn't have he or she in the right position and I had to find the right position to be to. I, I didn't have the luxury to fire anybody because if there was a hole, there was a gap there. If I got rid of that mm -hmm. individual, I had to wait for somebody else who I'm not sure is going to be any better than that. So my job, my responsibility was to find the right square hole to put that uh, square peg in as best I could. And not, not, that's a perfect world and that doesn't always work. But I, that, was, that was my responsibility to try to find out what fires that person up. Back to sincerity. Let everybody know what you're expecting of them and you're depending on them. I heard that all my life. My dad came out of the North Georgia mountains with an eighth grade education. One of the wisest men ever knew, was not well educated, one of the wisest men he ever knew. He never discouraged me. My nickname to him, for whatever reason, he called me Cowboy. That's just, as a little kid, he called me Cowboy. He said, Cowboy, I'm dependent on you. I would put my little chest up and whatever my daddy wanted me to do, because he encouraged me. He was sincere. Mm. He was counting on me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to let him down. I saw other people, and I know some close friends, their children were down. You know, they were criticized. Uh, yeah, you screwed that up again. That is not helpful. It, it, also, it also communicates that he believed in you. If I was, like, if somebody came, you're the Norcross Flash, I'd be like, I'm oh, he, let, he thinks, I am not going to let him he down. He thinks Vietnamese are in trouble now. North Coast Flash is coming I'm after him. Right? That's how I feel. <laughs> I'm not going to let him down. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me talk about counseling, right? Mm -hmm. Real. You would think in, in, in media, television, movies depict many times military leaders not in a way that I, that I experienced. Gruff, tough, rah, rah, you know, all this kind of thing. That's really not the way I saw it, not the way I... Uh, dealt with life in the military, in the army. Counseling. An individual has messed up. They would come see the commander, me. And I'm in all levels, lieutenant captain, major, lieutenant colonel, colonel, whatever. Whatever level I'm in, somebody's got to eventually, they mess up, they got to come see the old man. I'm the old man, right? Three C's. Compliment. Correct. Compliment. They would come into me, and, and he, the guy, sometimes their head's down, and they know they've really messed up or whatever. And uh, they'd come in, and I'd say, you know, Joe or whatever his name, I really like, he's expecting to get me, I'm going to rip him up, he thinks. He comes in, Joe, you know, I saw the other day, you really did a great job on X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. He goes, his ears perk up. He is now receptive to me talking to him. Mm-hmm because I have related to him or her something that I recognize that's really good that he or she has done or does. Receptive. They are receptive yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm respectful to them. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting them down. They're already feeling bad. Well, you know, Joe, you know, you do that well so good. Why? You know, the other day when you kind of messed up or whatever happened, blah, blah, blah. Could you apply that kind of standard to receptive yeah okay i'm getting what you're saying mm -hmm. colonel white major whatever it was 
Compliment, correct, and at the end, compliment with something else. They leave your office, they leave your environment feeling, I guess I'm not as, I'm going to do, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let that guy down. He's depending on me. I commanded thousands of people over a period of 31 years. I never had anybody really eventually disappoint me. Hmm. My first reaction, by the way, is, is it may, my personality, I can't say this works for everybody. My first reaction when somebody messes up was disappointment, not anger. Mm -hmm. Anger does not lead you to good things sometimes. And let them know you're disappointed. You have expectations for them. You know, build them up. Um, is that a soft way to leave? I don't think so. Because again, I didn't have the luxury to get rid of people because there was another guy standing in the line to come in there. I had to You're develop. still being direct. I had to you develop. are focusing on the problem. It's not like you're brushing under the rug. I had to right? develop what I had. Mm -hmm. had, to, had to develop what I had. And you said the luxury too, because that's what I think sometimes is, you know, if you, are you wanting to release this person because you're being lazy? Because you have the luxury of doing it and you really should pretend like you don't. Then what could you do? Now, now, <laughs> and then don't get me wrong. I mean, I didn't have... I didn't have a budget where I can only afford 10 folks mm -hmm. that if, if I, I, I can't pull the, if he's quote dead weight or whatever, mm -hmm. but I still need to work with that individual, find out why are you dead weight? What, why are you, yeah. what's, what's in your life that be concerned, interested and so forth. And you said it as a leader, it's my job to pull out of that person the best that's there. Have I done that? Have I given them a fair shot? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I led by, I did not lead by fear. Um, that because fear doesn't last long. After a while, you can't beat me. You can only beat me so hard, you know. Okay. Um, you you really you really lead by the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Do under to others as they would have as you would have them do unto you. Uh, a question: Would you want to work for you? Would you want to work for you? Um, I. If people, and, and this would have happened early in my career, people yelling at me and things like that, that did not work for me. I mean, I'm going to do it, mm. but I'll work for you harder. I'll die. I'll do everything I can for you if I respect you. If I don't respect you, um, you know, I'll, I'll do it because you're screaming at me or something like that, but it's not out of my heart. And it has a shelf life. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I didn't want to. The guy that gave me the name, the Norcos Flash, I didn't mm -hmm. want to disappoint at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Lizzie, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't want to disappoint, disappoint me. And he probably be one reason I ended up being a colonel in the army is because of him, you know. And, and that was what, 60 seconds? You said? 60 like, seconds. Yeah. Uh, the impressions. One thing I, I mentioned, there, there's a lot of things we could talk about. I live by this. Are you better having been with me? for this period of time? Am I better for having been with you for this period of time? You want people to walk away saying, consciously or unconsciously, they're better off having been in the environment of that person. You know? It, it, mm, very much. And, yeah. it, and, it, and you don't necessarily have to think about it, but if you're, if you're concerned about other people, you show interest in them, they're going to walk away having been better experience having been in your presence. Yeah, but I, I've always, I think everybody has a different view of that kind of concept. And I, I, I picture myself a lot after seeing, you know, go to God and God says, uh, you know, what, what did you do? Like, why do you, why, why should you be in my presence? You know, and the thing that I think about a lot as well, uh, you know, I messed up a lot, committed a lot of sins. On the other hand, uh, I, I I found the, peop the people that you put under my authority, I helped them find their gifts that you gave them. I helped mm -hmm. encourage them to fulfill the best that they could be with your glory, and I never gave up on them. Yep. And I'm like, that's the answer I want to give God. Mm -hmm. If I can't give that answer, I'm going to be really scared of what he might say after that. <laughs> yep. Right? Because that's really your job. Yep. And he's like, well, what about yourself? Well, I already know that God made me to do that so that's what i have to do right and mm -hmm. but i have to act it out because talk is cheap i know you're a prayerful man and, and, and likewise i am uh and, and i fail in this many times so i'll tell you what i consciously want to do every time before i walk into a meeting to church to a ball game to a visit to a i ask god 
to bless my tongue. Mm -hmm. Bless the words that I say. Mm -hmm. And, many, and that, not, don't get me wrong, sometimes I forget to do that. And I'll say something stupid. You know, I want the Holy Spirit covering me and filtering me and protecting that, that muscle that's in your mouth that can destroy people. You know? And I pray to God, just, you know, let me be something good. Not because I want pats on the back, but you, you, want, you want the Holy Spirit to be seen through you. Not for you to get the glory. That's not it at all. But, but the glory goes to God. So I, I try to remember to say that prayer every time I walk into wherever that I'm going to, even if I walk into the grocery store. If I, it, it could be a simple word of praise or thanks or appreciation. You don't know what that person's going through, you know? And I don't mean being an actor or being false about it. I mean, but just. Absolutely. Let, let God bless those, those meetings. Absolutely. Can I hit a few words? Please, here? please. Uh, and this is a two page document that I came up with, Dan. I was asked uh, in civilian life in a job I had, I was asked to give a leadership class. <laughs> So, uh, and so, uh, okay, and I never put things to paper about leadership. And by the way, two pages will never cover because this is continuous, mm -hmm. but I'm going to, there's a few key words mm -hmm. I just wanted to focus on. Uh, and I entitled it Leadership, the Art and Science because it's both. Mm. Character. Mm. Are, a good character, a person that you can depend on, mm -hmm. you know, do you have that kind of character? Mm -hmm. Do you always choose the hard right versus the easy wrong? Never ask anyone to do something unpleasant, dangerous, something you don't want to do that you wouldn't do yourself. Now, I saw that every day in combat because mm -hmm. you're asking guys to basically get killed, <laughs> you know? Are you placing that guy out there? Would you do the same thing? They're going to see. Nobody, I always say this, nobody ever dug my foxhole. Mm. I, I, you know, I'm a lieutenant, I'm a captain, I'm a whatever, but I dig my own foxhole. And a foxhole can apply to anything. I'm just using that as yeah, a. Yeah, sure. Yep. Be worthy of others to emulate you. Mm. Be worthy mm -hmm. of that emulation, you know? Yeah. Leaders are constantly observed. Make it a worthwhile experience. You're a leader. You're constantly being observed. Make it worthwhile for the first person that's looking at you. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Responsibility. When in charge, take charge. It goes back to what I said earlier. The day you take, the moment you take over, you're in charge. You're responsible. Do not blame somebody behind you before you or after. You know, well, he or she messes this place up. Don't, just don't keep your mouth shut. Just fix it. Get it done. Don't blame somebody else. Don't ever say not my job or not my fault. Take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Take the blame. Take the blame and provide the praise to others. I'll get, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a father and brag of my son right now. So my son uh, Graham White's been in the Army 21 years, uh, 11 combat deployments, three to Afghanistan, uh, three to Iraq, eight to Afghanistan. He's in Afghanistan as we speak, uh, wounded in 2003. And the first IED that killed anybody killed his driver, killed his gunner. He was had a sucking a left chest wound. Hmm. Uh, and I've been in, around some of his men without him even present. And they would come up to me, and I'm a retired colonel. There's nothing I can do. For this. So if they're trying to butter me up, there's nothing I can do for him. I'm a retired colonel. So this, I would take this as coming from their heart. And they would say, sir, I'd follow your son anywhere. I said, really? He said, you, if, if, we, if things mess up, Lieutenant White, Captain White, Major White, Colonel White, Lieutenant, whatever his rank was, he takes all the blame. If there's any praise and they direct it to, to your son, he said, oh, that's because Dan did so-and-so. That's because Stephanie did so, so He deflects compliments. He accepts blame. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean 
once he accepts that blame, he may pull me off in the corner and say, hey, you know, you need to really square this away. But to the outside world, he protects his unit. He protects his troops. He protects his people. And he provides all the glory to them. Pushes it that out. That makes me think of Jesus, like totally. Just takes all the blame and gives all the credit, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. Treating others. Treat others with dignity and respect. Just because you're the boss doesn't make that you're not God. <laughs> you know, back to the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Would you want to work for yourself? Desire, you and I talked about that. You got a desire to be a one a good leader. By the way, I use, we use the word leader. We're not using the word management. That's, that's, uh, a good leader is a good manager. A good man, a manager is not necessarily a good leader. Yes. Not necessarily. You'd totally. like them to be, but leadership is a higher level than management. Okay? Yep. Different calling, too. I think it's a totally different calling, yeah. Optimism and confidence. Uh, be, the, be the person that the glass is half full and be confident. That, don't, that doesn't mean overconfident. You know, you're always open to information, uh, humility, uh, things can people help you out, but, but at least be confident because mm. people are, again, they're looking at you. Is, is he or she, do they know what they're doing? Selflessness. Thinking about others before yourself. In here, I've got the, the leader eats last. In the military, um, Whenever we were out in the field, especially, the higher the rank, the, the further back in the line you were to eat. Let's pretend that we're serving, that we're out in the field now. And, and this can apply, I'm just using food as an example, but you can apply the selflessness to many things. We're being served spaghetti with sauce and meatballs. The lowest ranking guy in that unit gets the spaghetti, the meat sauce, um, and the meat sauce and the meatballs. The privates go through. The sergeants, whoop, we ran out of meatballs, so the sergeants are getting spaghetti and sauce. And the officers, and the, finally the commander, maybe get some spaghetti if there's any left. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's selflessness. You take care of those people, and they, they recognize that, and you're not manipulating, you're not trying to trick them, but you're being selfless. You take care of your people. They will always take care of you. People ask the question, which is more important, the people or the mission? They're two different things. People always. But you can't achieve the mission without the people. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. you, right. you, 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 you always take care of your people. If you do that, you take care of the mission. The mission is going to get accomplished. And getting them to care about the mission as much as you do. Important mm -hmm. too, right? Let me just read this closing thoughts. Mm -hmm. All of us are called to be leaders. Leaders have many titles like husband, wife, mom, dad, teacher, coach, nurse, doctor, sergeant, manager, CEO, general, president, so on and so on. Regardless of the title, all leaders have the responsibility of accomplishing the mission and taking care of those that we lead. The traits listed are not the traits that I mentioned before listed are not considered by me to be profound, but they're from my heart. They've always stood me in good stead and have been acquired over several decades of experiences, mm. both dire and mundane. Mm. This list is no by means complete, and therefore the serious reader is encouraged to reflect on and add to it. Are leaders born or made? Yes. So That's pretty cool. I, uh, I enjoyed being a leader, not because I got to be the boss, but one reason I enjoyed gaining higher rank in the Army was because I could hopefully influence more people in a positive way. The higher in rank you got, the more people you're responsible for, hopefully you're affecting them in a positive way. There's more of them. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't about ego, it wasn't about more money or anything like that, it was about how many more people could I help in that regard? And that's and I think God placed that in me. I placed a, a desire to help people, mm -hmm. and, I, and I thank God for that. You that's said awesome. you had some closing thoughts. Yeah, there. no, thank you. Um, I uh, yeah, it, kind of a little fun thing. 
to close it out. Um, you ever heard of the Budweiser hot seat? I'm not sure that I have. Never? I mm. I don't think so. It's not a plug for Budweiser. It's just usually they and they would ask you like rapid fire questions. It's just fun. Mm -hmm. So I have one more thing. So I had, I wrote down some like four little phrases or words, and I wanted to see like <clears throat> just the first word or phrase that came to your mind when I either say the. I understand what you're saying. It's, okay. It's like password, right? Uh, so the first one is discipline. You mean the first thing comes out of my mind when you say a word? When I say discipline, what do you think of first? Making your bed. I think I get that. Uh, number two, self-respect. Shaving every day. Cool. Number three, don't make excuses. Weakness, if you do. Hmm. That's good. And the last one is, what makes a man a man? Following Jesus. <laughs> good. Good ending. That was really good. I enjoyed it. I love the making the bed thing, because I... I heard an ad, there was an admiral talking on YouTube yeah, about I, why do you make your bed? And it was all about, because I was going through a period of time where I was like sort of in a funk, right? And he's like, get up and make your bed and have your first accomplishment of the day. Exactly. And feel good about it. Exactly. And I was like, that might even work. And, and, <laughs> and, and it's not necessarily, you don't have to just say it's got to be the bed. It's got what he, what that admiral, uh, I know his name, but I can't think of it right now. What the point he was making is start your day off in a positive manner by accomplishing something. And so making your beds an accomplishment. An accomplishment That's why I say something. discipline. Put your mind in that yeah. groove. Get it yeah. going. Yeah. I, I try to read the Bible. Uh, I read a chapter in the Old Testament, chapter yeah. in the New Testament every morning. Uh, you know, try, it just gets your, you, you, can't, you can't be in the Word of God. You cannot be in prayer and have a bad attitude. I can't. I can't speak yeah, for can't everybody else. But it puts your mind, so you've accomplished totally, something. Yeah. yeah. So, and when you're leading, that's really important to have your mind in that area. So, What, what, did you, what was the one I responded with, shaving? Self-respect. Yeah. Um, uh, my wife and I are both of this mindset. <laughs> we will not leave this house. Well, let me say it this way. When I was getting the command of battalion in the 82nd Airborne Division, we were going through, we always would go through pre-command training to kind of get what's the latest and things about the military. And so we're at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And um, so the guy was talking. He said, you guys, and we're all men, by the way, I'm sorry. There were no women at this time. This is back in the early 80s. He said, you men are going to be battalion commanders. You're going to be responsible for several thousand young soldiers throughout the Army, all over the world. Mm -hmm. Don't ever get up on Saturday morning to go to the PX, PX, you know, post exchange, the grocery store, the store. And he just said it this way. Don't ever go to the PX without shaving. Because somebody's going to see you and say, that's Colonel White. Man, he looks like a bum. Because they see you every day in your uniform, you're squared mm -hmm. away. He said, you're always on display. Have enough self-discipline and self-respect to shave in the morning. Look, you're decent. And I don't care if you're going out to run or whatever mm -hmm. but and boy that stuck with me mm -hmm. not that i was not doing it but i was kind of doing it without thinking about it but uh, but she and i'll go to kroger and uh we try it's not it's not um, being prideful but having pride there's two different that's a different thing you know mm -hmm. and so i just sh shaving is just not necessarily shaving but just being be respectful of other people that you're going to, you're respecting them. Totally. Self-respect is a respect Several, towards other people. Exactly. Respect other people.